at the end, if you want to ask any questions over voice, just raise your hand and we'll be more than happy to answer them to the best of our ability. If there's anything we can't answer, I'll uh, get back to you. All right, just a brief introduction about me. Uh, I've been working with Alloy for about, for actually over nine years now as a senior system engineer. I've done previous roles before that in voice over IP, SIP and security. Uh, while I know a lot about the field, there's always someone else out there who's going to know more than me. Um, I have been on a lot of webinars throughout my time and I know that they can drag on. I'm going to do my best to not waffle on and uh, apologies in advance should I do so. All right, so I'm going to give you a general overview of 3CX, go through network ports, router configurations, touch on security versus convenience, have a quick chat about SBCs, go through some hacking tools that are out on the internet and how they can affect you, and go through some vulnerability points on the 3CX system and how to keep yourself safe. All right, so 3CX is a software-based PBX which needs to be installed on either a server Windows operating system or a Linux distribution. Uh, Alloy and 3CX, we've been working with 3CX, I think version 8, version 9, and now they're up to version 18. So originally it was only available on Windows and could be installed on Windows XP. So now it can be installed on pretty much all up to date Windows platforms and Linux distributions. Generally, my thoughts on 3CX as a whole is it's a pretty good. PBX, uh, as long as you don't use unsupported phones, unsupported network architecture, don't play around with all the settings. Um, if you leave everything default and don't go into the advanced settings and change things that you shouldn't, most of the time you're looking pretty good. So, question that generally gets asked is always a toss up between security versus convenience. Now, unfortunately, this is never, it's almost impossible to answer, I find. You might always say it is, you want to set up the system as secure as possible because that's always the best option for your customer. However, things need to be considered with your customer because it's not always plausible due to, you know, things such as your client's budget and, you know, cost involved and things like that. As in, you might have a client who has, you know, four extensions and going in there trying to pitch things such as setting up secure RTP, installing private VLANs, two factor authentication, um, which, you know, is going to cost them tens of thousands of dollars for a small business. It's quite unlikely that they're going to say yes to that. But you just need to scope out what are the best options for your client and what you can do with the budget that they have. There's also going to be some times where your client's going to want to use that 10 year old phone off eBay and be adamant that they need to use this phone and you're going to need to steer them away from that because it's very vulnerable and very likely to be insecure. And some other factors you need to consider today are is the remote workforce. Everyone is working, for, well, not everyone, but a high majority of people in Australia at the moment are working from home and they have their own personal PCs. So you need to know if that's allowed in their office environment and if the, and the other things are such as are they, they using physical phones? Will they be using soft phones? Can they be used configured using the 36 tunnel? OK, so let's start looking at securing the actual phone system first. Now. The SIP ports that are used by 36 are pretty much the same as all PBX is out there and here's a general overview of the ports that 3CX use to be configured on your firewall router. The ones here are 5060 inbound and 5061 inbound TCP UDP. There are other ports that are used for 3CX such as man management ports and also things like database ports. Now with the database ports don't open those uh, there's no real reason to do that 
uh, please don't do it. It's going to give you a headache and you're really opening yourself up to some serious, serious vulnerabilities if you do that. So don't do that. Um, the only reason that you would really do that is sometimes you'll have third party applications where, you know, you have, you might get, you know, tools, things like VoIP tools or third party APIs and a few other things that need access to it. But if, unless you really, really know what you're doing and you know how to secure it, don't open up things such as database ports because having that open on the internet is really going to hurt you. All right. Now, the next thing, having the ports open is good, but what you need to do is be able to lock it down to a certain source IP. So why is this important? This is important so that only the PBX, the 3CX PBX, only reply to the IP addresses that you want it to reply to. So that means that you will want to put things such as your, you know, your company's IP address, remote workers, um, remote offices, things like that. And it won't listen to other IP addresses that aren't supposed to listen to it. Um, graphic here, I've just done a quick screenshot of a inbound firewall rule on Azure Cloud. And all it, is, all it shows here is the IP address with 5060 source into the PBX and anything else is discarded. So you think that would that's probably probably pretty good. Um, so what happens if you don't do this? Uh, and also how can you check? So there's you can put your rule in and then do you know if it works? You know, without testing, there's no real way you know if it worked properly, you applied your rule, and those sort of things. And the other thing to consider is there's firewalls itself on the on the server. So you have firewall rules on the Windows system. You have firewall rules on the Linux operating system as well. So if you don't have firewalls on your router, there's also firewalls on the operating system. Now, 3CX, the Linux version, will have default firewall rules, which you shouldn't touch. Windows will be dependent on the whatever you have set. Now, this graphic here is just showing an output of the 3CX IP tables, and I'm pretty sure those are the default ones. I just grabbed them from ours. Uh, you shouldn't really touch any of this. There's no real, real, real reason to open it up. These are just allowing the ports that 3CX uses and discarding the rest. Now, Windows, you can install other things on the server, such as, I don't know, people install web servers, mail servers, file servers, all, all, all kinds of stuff which will cause lots of headaches for you in the future. So if possible, strongly recommend to your client that you have 3CX running on its own and doesn't share resources with something else. Also that that doesn't need extra ports open for that particular service to run. While it might consume another Windows license, it's um, it's definitely going to be a lot easier for you because it's just you will have a countless amount of errors in the future with shared things, especially things like Microsoft Exchange. It's come across a lot of times people install mail servers, then they install 3CX, then they have all these particular issues with web servers, things not connecting, etc. So now that you've checked your firewall rules, you've done your source firewall rules, you've checked your You've checked your firewall rules on your server and everything looks great. So how do you test it? How do you know that your firewall rules are set up properly and your protected 56, port 5060? You use port scanning tools. So this one is Nmap and this is a very useful tool to scan for ports, open ports on, on servers. So this is just a screenshot of me running an nmap scan on an ip address just to check for port 5060 being open on udp so the top picture is me just putting that that command into onto my well from my server and the bottom picture essentially is showing me that there's an open port 5060 so from that it's showing that that actually is open to the internet on that port now if you don't have 
a virtual server or you don't have a Linux command line, which you know, not everyone will have, you can actually Google port scanners online and you'll see there's multiple websites. I think you can put in an IP address and a port and it'll do a scan for you. Personally, I prefer to do it myself. You just get more freedom of what you scan and the results are all yours to see and play with, etc. But not everyone has their own, you know, server to log in and do their stuff with. So, all right. So from here, you've checked it, your port's open. So what now? What What's the big deal? The port's open, who cares? Everything connects fine and customers' phones work. You've got no issues. Everything's super easy. Everything works. Why do you have to worry? Well, unfortunately, the internet sucks. It's full of bots. Bots taking to look advantage of vulnerabilities. Um, what I'm going to show you now is one of those bots called Sip Vicious and how it works and how it can uh, make you have an unpleasant day. So, Sip Vicious is a PBX penetration tool which is used, okay, which is supposed to be used for legit testing purposes, but rather a way to find usernames and passwords of extensions on a PBX. Crack these, use to send a whole bunch of international calls at your expense or most likely your customer's expense. It's no good and generally we don't want that to happen. So you may have had some of your clients or customers or even yourself notice that your phones just randomly ring with extension 100 or anonymous or just random stuff. Their phone's ringing, they pick it up, there's nothing there. Likely this is usually a PBX penetration tool just scanning your PBX for information. The first picture on the left is one that I've used just scanning a phone system and it is looking for extensions 1000 to 1010 and it's sending an invite packet on port 5067. And as you can see, it comes back with information saying that, look, there's five extensions and they all require authentication. And what this would have done is for the client, which was my own testing, so it's my own my own um, virtual environment. It made all the phones ring, so that would make all your phones ring and they'd pick it up and there'd be no one there. But this gives your attacker the information that they need to know that, hey, there's some extensions, they have usernames and passwords. So once the, once the attacker has this, then they can essentially go, okay, I know that extension number, and then they can use Sipfishers to crack the password. So they can essentially, in the bottom picture is the tool used that they use to get that extension number and they use a word list to, you know, brute force the, the password there. So from the bottom one, you can see the extension number is 1002 and that's the password. So with that information there, the attacker can then essentially use that username and password, log in, start making calls and well, no, no good, no good. Now with word lists is a um, very good idea, not just for 3CX, but just in common practice is change your password regularly and don't use common passwords. Word lists are generally consisting of old passwords that have been part of data breaches. So they're not just silly password one, password two, or anything like that. They're files with, I don't know, a million different used passwords on the internet that people use, and they use variations of that. So it's important to know that you should change your passwords regularly and don't keep it simple because it will get cracked. All right, so from here, you're looking at that, your phone system's open, it could be open to tip fishes. So that that's pretty, that's that sucks. So what does 3CX do about that? How can 3CX protect you from something like this happening? Through 3CX's advanced parameters. For starters, I urge you, please don't touch this stuff. It's really important that you don't go in here, deleting things, adding things, because it can stop so many things from happening that you don't realize that it's there. As you can see on the left hand side, it's got the thing I highlighted, it's called Friendly Scanner. 
Now that's what three, that's what SIPVicious uses as a user agent to probe phone systems to respond and get that information. Now, once, yeah, so essentially all this stuff here, don't touch it. I mean, there's no real reason to delete any of these. You may add some, I guess, if you find some that are trying to penetrate your system that aren't here. But one, one good thing is to keep your system up to date because 3CX, any, any sort of new attack that comes out, because, you know, people update their attack vectors regularly, new ways to get into systems, they use new, new systems with new user agents, they'll come up here. So make sure that you do update 3CX regularly when you can. It will contain new user agents, new ways to protect you that come out regularly. Um, so 3CX, you've got your friendly scanner block there, that'll block SIPVicious. So everything's okay then, no problem, everything's good. SIPVicious is blocked, I'm safe, no problem. Well, sort of, except that that will stop basic bots, but um, anyone with a little bit of knowledge can get around it. So I'll show you a little bit about inside SIPVicious and how to get around that. So SIPVicious is a Python, uses a Python scripting language, and I'm running this from my Kali Linux operating system. So you can see on the top left, the picture there says the user agent is friendly scanner, and that is what 3CX looks for. So unfortunately, an extremely easy way to get around that is changing that user agent field, which is just text, to a Yealink T46G. So then when you use SIPVicious onto the, the 3CX system, it will come in as a Yealink phone, which it doesn't have a, you know, it's not blocking a Yealink phone because a Yealink's, you know, a legitimate, a legitimate user agent. So then it will get information, it won't block SIPVicious requests. Now, the bottom, the bottom photo there is just a brief picture that I, I've done there to show you how quickly this, this tool is used on the internet. Um, you, you literally just write random scan and it will just look online for IP addresses and PBXs for you and list them for you. So that took that random scan, I did that, I don't know, two days ago and it took about 30 seconds and it's given me four, four PBXs that are vulnerable for SIPVicious to start doing its nasty stuff too. Um, so you don't want your phone system really to be coming up in a list like this. Now, this this SIPVicious is everywhere. It's all over the internet. There's so many of it, instances of it running, looking for PBXs. There's so many things trying to hack it, hack your system, trying to get into it. It's um, you need to be careful. All right, so essentially I've just told you that firstly 3CX is good, and I've told you that actually if you've got heart, any sort of Python scripting knowledge, you can get around it pretty quick. So I've just contradicted myself, right? Well, not, not exactly. 3CX does have other defense mechanisms against that. So it's still pretty good. Under here, you've got your 3CX anti-hacking parameters. Please, please, please don't touch these. These will protect you against essentially all the things that I've just said. So you're going to have, if you have someone or any sort of one hacking your system who is using user agents that aren't blocked, this needs to this needs to stop it there. So if those attempts are hitting your system, they need to be blocked. 3CX needs to go, okay, these are dodgy we're going to put them on the blacklist. Because if you are playing with these because you've got a phone that isn't registering properly, you're having an issue with an old phone or someone's extension is getting blocked too easily because the password's wrong um, and you decide, well, if I turn this off, it registers fine. So I'm just going to leave it off. Don't do that. Fix the phone problem. Um, while it may be a quick fix. I know some phones are very, very um, sensitive to uh, SIP registrations when they send you know, their SIP digest messages. 
but just don't um, don't quick fix those by changing these parameters because these parameters will save you if you have someone who is essentially trying to target your phone system that isn't just a bot. Um, these will block them legitimately and they'll put it on the blacklist and it, then once it's on the blacklist, the when you run commands on Zipficious, you get nothing. You get blank. Nothing comes up. It goes. You just don't get any sort of any sort of message back. So it's just it's as if the PBX doesn't exist once it's blacklisted. So it's important. Don't um just just don't play with these settings. Really, once you play with these settings, bad stuff happens. Okay. So now. 3CX itself looking pretty good. Um, again, all this other stuff, all these hacking parameters can be stopped if you have 5060 only open to your selected, you know, points like your VoIP provider, your offices, your um, whatever you need it to, and you block everything else, then SIPFishes or any other tools won't get through. So that's if you don't have the ability to do that should the router that you use not be able to block not be able to set a uh, file rule based on source ip but really most routers especially routers used for business which i imagine most most of you guys are um, should really have source ips for sip on there and uh, i know a lot of you will have questions such as, well, we all have dynamic IPs, so that's ridiculous. Uh, then there are other things that you can use, such as session border controllers, the 3CX tunnel, uh, VPNs. There's other options around that. All right, so now if we look at 3CX, we need to look at other ways 3CX can be exploited and what you need to do to protect yourself. So unfortunately, today, these days, it's not just as simple as blocking someone who's attacking you from a um, from the command line, from a bot to get 3CX exploited. Now, a lot of the times these days, attacks are done via social engineering, which means rather than exploiting the actual phone system, they exploit a user, and it's usually a user who has access to the phone system itself. So 3CX can be hosted on Windows, can be hosted on Linux, uh, Windows Server, etc. Um, things that need to be considered is who has access to the server. Uh, you know, who, how many people have access to the the servers itself? Have you done an audit of who used to have access to the server that's left the company? Might not have changed the password since they've left. They still have access, and they might be using it. Who knows? Um, if it's on Linux, who's got root access? Do you use SSH keys? Have you given out those keys to certain people so they can log in? Have you revoked them after they've left? Uh, all these things you need to you need to be aware of because once you have access to the actual system itself that it's hosted on, then you then you're vulnerable there as well. So the other thing is you need to make sure these passwords for your server and your RDP sessions are quite complex too. You can't just have your 3CX console all secure. Your router is all secure. Everything's great. Your extension passwords are good. But your root password for your system is root and your Windows password is something just guessable. And you know, once they have access to your system itself, then they can do whatever they want almost. So you need to make sure this point here is also quite protected. Now, Another important one, the web console. So if someone has access to your 3CX web console that shouldn't have it, well, you're in a lot of trouble. From here, they can do pretty much everything they want to do. They can exploit the system, make any changes, route international calls, make all these international calls, set up extensions for international calls, remove security rules. This is one that is really important that you don't that you keep in check, as in you don't have 10 people who have access to all these passwords for your clients. You don't have a central server where they're all bookmarked and saved, all those kind of things. Well, it sounds silly and you think, why would you do that? 
it happens sometimes you know you're a bit you're a company and you just it's easier to have you have all these bookmarks for all your customers and they just click it and all your engineers just go yep click this click this it's all saved um while it's quick don't do it just don't do it um i've had customers that happened to a customer i think last year where they had about six or seven three six things bookmarked and that server itself was compromised so then all their pbx's that were linked via that um by that browser they all got compromised too and it's uh, i guess it's just lazy um it's convenient but it's just you just don't do it it's just um the amount of trouble it can cause is just immense um you're not only gonna lose not only your customers are not only gonna get massive bills you're gonna have to explain it you're also gonna lose your customers pretty much they're not gonna trust you anymore and it's you can minimize that by just not having that kind of set up in the first place. So it's also important to monitor the staff who do it because if you're a manager and you have you know engineers that do do these tasks, you just still need to monitor how they're storing this information as well. And the fact that they don't do things like save password in the browser or you know that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Other thing is just make sure the passwords aren't saved somewhere else. You know, like you don't have passwords.txt or passwords stay saved in a central location that more than only the certain people can access. Realistically, you shouldn't shouldn't even have a password file at all. I mean, that's pretty sloppy. If you, you know, if it gets compromised, someone gets access to that file, then they're gone. It's you can't afford to have this page compromised you can't afford someone else to have access to this um, now what, what can you do about it you can change some access on this page under the security settings you can actually allow only specific ip addresses to access the web console so from here you can say only specific ip addresses can see the web console so if you have a look you can click add you can add wan ip addresses you can add public ip addresses private IP addresses so that even if someone was to get that password, if they're not on this particular list, they won't have access to see it. So there are fail safes you can add with 3CX in case someone gets those passwords that shouldn't, but you know, let's let's just not let them get them in the first place. However, it's a good practice to have you know only a certain IP addresses allowed here. So having this on is a good idea too, just in case something like that does happen, you call your customer, your client safe. The other thing, backups. Um, I don't know in version 18 or 16, but I know in a lot of the previous ones, the backups store the admin password. So that's um, very important that you don't have that saved on a file share that's accessed by your company or people that shouldn't have access to it. So you need to make sure your backup files for your customers aren't just backup.zip that you can double click and open. At least put passwords on it, encrypt it, because unfortunately there's ways you can open those up and open the XML and see admin password is this and it's in plain text and it gets you in. So you need to secure your backup files as well. So those, those are very important. I don't know if 3CX go into it too much in training or not, but you need to really make sure your backup files also, you save them somewhere safe and you encrypt them because again, the passwords are there. They can't, you, you just gotta make sure that you, um, you know, protect yourself from there. All right, some other, other options. You've got your VPNs, SBCs, your 3CX tunnels. So, Open VPN, VPNs is a pretty popular open source application that you can use. And 3.6 support, supported handsets use Open VPN directly onto the handset itself. I don't know if every single supported handset they have works for Open VPN, but a lot of them you can install the VPN client on the phone. So if you're you have a VPN server on the same network as your PBX. You can essentially run a VPN client on your phones. 
VPN client on the computers, and then you don't need to open any of the ports to the internet and all of your phones and your PCs, et cetera, can get to the server via the VPN. So everything's encrypted, everything's safe, nothing's going over the internet um, on those ports. Now, that sounds good. However, it's not always plausible and can be a bit tricky, especially with, um, you know, some people just find it difficult to, to run VPN clients. It's also hard to install and on some phones and they might be using phones that, you know, you might be using a different variety of different phones that, you know, Yalings have it and then they might be using some Fanville phone or some other phone that doesn't have a VPN client but still needs access. Now, there's ways they can still get access. You can install a 3CX SBC and the SBC itself will then route all the traffic from that SBC directly to 3CX via the 3CX tunnel. But then you've got to weigh up the options between how much that's going to cost, your admin running, how much work it's going to take. Um, again, it goes back to that convenience versus security thing. Like it may even be easier just when you're implementing the system just to say, look, you've got four phones that won't fit this particular security model. Let's upgrade them or let's remove those and use soft phones instead. Let's use 3CX soft phone on your computer, use this headset, use it, use that instead, use a web browser, etc. Um, your client obviously wants to be able to use, you know, everyone on there to use the phone. So you just need to really make sure that they can, but you also need to, you know, it, it's really going to be, it's, always, it's all, almost always a budget thing. Um, you can set up the most secure system in the world, but once you tell them how much it costs, it's when things change. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can use the best way or easiest, cheapest way really, is if you have just 3CX only and you use the 3CX tunnel. So that is something that's native to 3CX. So if they're just using soft phones on their computer, mobile clients, you can just use the 3CX tunnel and it doesn't need to have 5060 open. It just does everything through the encrypted 3CX tunnel. And yeah, it's it's quite safe. And you know, it's 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 pretty good. Now, this one happens a lot, and um, not a lot of people. <laughs> A lot of people, I guess, but it happens that the IP phones themselves are the things that get hacked. Now, phones themselves have a lot user user passwords and admin passwords. Now, if you auto provision the phone on 3CX, you're looking good. It puts passwords on it that you can't guess. It's not going to be admin as a username, admin as a password. Now. If you decide to not do a auto provisioning due to reasons that it didn't work or you don't have things open, whatever, and you just point it to the, the PBX without changing the username and password for the phone, um, chances are that that phone could be compromised pretty quickly if you open up the web ports. Now, a lot of people that I've come across in my time have the web ports of the phones open so they can do modifications to the phones for their customers. Now, while this sounds convenient, if you were to open up a Yalink phone, which is not auto provisioned and has the default passwords, you can literally go to one of the tabs, go to the, uh, I think it's like the phone book option and press dial and you put in a phone number and start using the phone to dial. And you can make, and you can just dial phone international calls from there. Um, so, if you can, always auto provision the phone from 3CX. That will update the user password and the admin password. Secondly, don't don't open to the web. Don't open port 80 or 443 to the phone. While it may be convenient for you. You might have a client who keeps asking you to update their BLFs or I need you to change this or change that. Um, it, it's risky. You're putting the web interface of a phone online and um, should that password not be, should that password be default, it's going to get hacked so fast. And again, phone bills just can 
rec complete your recu. Here's something I'll briefly touch on. So there's a database that 36 uses. It's called um, it runs a Postgres SQL database, which you which is actually pretty cool. You can do a lot of custom programming onto it. Now this is how a lot of the third party applications work. Now it's you know you get a lot of things that are not in 3CX they're out of the box. However, it can be used, you know, while it can be used for professionals to incorporate things into your system, unless you are one of those professionals and you aren't here just to have a bit of a play with it, don't go in here and change this stuff because you can open up your whole database for 3CX and then you're done. It's done. Like if, if you give read write access to the internet or anyone that's not meant to have it, they get access to everything on 3CX and likely um, they can modify table fields, delete things. Um, it's happened before and the whole phone system's done. Like it's, it's, it wrecks the system completely. And if you don't have a backup, you have to start from scratch. And again, can be exploited, can be changed. Things can be changed. You don't want to be changed. So don't go opening those ports to the 3CX system. Don't go changing the, you know, the log reader, the Postgres passwords, the access levels, the IP addresses, all this kind of stuff. Only really high professionals that are doing that have applications that need to do it will get you to make changes to this. So don't, it's really unlikely that you should make these ports open or make any sort of changes to this. Just um, if you are dabbling in playing around with it, please don't use your live system. Whatever you do, don't decide to have a play with opening this up to your live system because it's almost certain that if you open this up to the internet, it's going to get hacked so fast. It's even more prevalent than SIP vicious things scanning for databases. It's always, there's bots always on the lookout for open databases. And once they find it, it gets hammered. So just use, if for whatever reason, you're, you're playing around with this, do it in a sandbox, do it with a test system, do it with something that's completely not production. I can, cannot stress that enough. So, while 3CX has the luxury of being installed on anything now, you can install it on, you know, any device, almost any platform. Unfortunately, this gives you the headache of having to protect said platform of everything against viruses, malware, so on. So, what this means is anyone running 3CX on their PC, you need to make sure that they have up-to-date antivirus protection, firewalls, malware protection for the computer itself, in case that itself becomes compromised, and then they can make calls on that on that computer via the 3CX application or even via the web browser now. Another thing people need to start really considering, which is starting to be a bit more popular, is running antivirus malware protection on their phones, even Apple phones. There's a lot of malware on the internet for mobile phones that makes it into Google Play Store, even legitimate Google Play Store apps. It sneaks in there and will get installed onto your phone and will start taking information and using it in the background. So having antivirus now on your mobile Malware protection on your mobile is important. Um, I know a lot of you probably already have it, but it's not something I hear a lot outside um, of the inner IT circle. So it's um, important to just make sure you, I mean, they're essentially their computers on your, on your phone. They're running operating systems. They have apps, things you can't see. You just need to start instructing people to have protection on your mobile phones, especially now with three, because how this relates to 3CX is 3CX has a mobile application on it. And, you know, there's going to be malware out there that's going to start using phone applications to make calls. They're just, it's just going to happen. It, and it's probably already out there. So you need to start protecting your devices. Um, 
pretty sure there's a lot of free ones out there. Anything's better than nothing, but it's just important to, you know, protect your stuff. Um, so what can you do on 3CX's NTR? So I've said that, you know, all the doom and gloom about being all these international calls, uh, that, you know, your database can get hacked, your PCs are going to get hacked, everything's, everything's awful, you're going to lose heaps of money, and you're in a panic. So should all that happen, how does 3CX itself stop, how does, how does 3CX protect you should all that stuff happen? Um, well, for starters, there is the allowed country codes. This is a very, very important section because it will stop international calls leaving the phone system, regardless of where it's coming from. So it's very important that you don't have every single country code ticked. Um, now, you're going to have clients who will say, I would like to dial every single country. And you also get ones with vague answer that will just say, well, I don't know, give me all the countries, sounds good. Important to try and get a bit more precise answers from them in relation to what countries they need to dial, because more than likely, there's, I don't know if they're gonna to need to dial Kazakhstan or some of those countries that are more, you know, prone to these international breaches. But there is going to be, you will get clients who will say, nope, you must, I must have every single international route ticked. Even after you've told them about the risks of that, they say, no, nope, I don't care. Tick them all. I need every single call um, enabled. So reluctantly, you tick them all and you, you don't feel good about it. So then what? What can you do? What, what's the what's the next failback option from that? You've got all the international calls enabled on the PBX, prone to being hacked. Um, it's not looking good. So the last thing, you, the last line of defence is your VoIP provider. Now, VoIP providers, I'd say, would be your last fail safe here to make sure that if they see international phone calls going out fast or to dodgy countries that they do a, they put a bar on those calls now it's very important bef before a security breach happens that you choose a void provider that in the event that your client is unfortunate enough to be hacked that with all international calls allowed you don't that they have a, a fail system in place to stop the bill going from tens of thousands of dollars to like a hundred dollars. A lot of them will have, you know, they might allow like three or four international calls within a minute to some country, and then it will flag a security flag and say, hey, this doesn't look right. So they'll, you know, they'll, they'll immediately put a bar on international calls. So the person attacking the system will only get four calls worth out before they can't make any more calls because the VoIP providers sense they um, you know, hey, this doesn't look right, so it's put a block on it. You don't want to be having a conversation with your customer the next day that there's a $30,000 phone bill um, and they have to pay it. They're going to say you have to pay it and you're going to have to, it's just a conversation and a big dispute that you have that you can avoid. Um, shameless plug, Alloy Voice monitor this. So if you go with us, we do have that that in place. So if you were to be hacked, you will not, you know, we will we monitor how many international calls go out and we block on a safeguard. So while we, we look for this as a provider, there are also a lot of other providers that do too. But you need to check, it's very important you check this prior to something like this happening, not after. It's um, trying to dispute between a VoIP provider, a customer, and you to who has to pay this bill. It, it's it's a very messy situation, and usually you have to pay 
a high portion of it. They might discount it, but there's still a high portion that has to be paid. And uh, if you just do these checks prior to implementation or prior to choosing whoever your VoIP provider is, then uh, you won't have this problem. So check before and not, not after. So the last thing we're going to touch on with 3CX is on a network level. Uh, last, uh, another layer of security again. And again, this depends on your client, budget, how sensitive the conversations are, I guess. Uh, if you have IP telephones, 3CX phones, mobile clients on the same network and Wi-Fi, chances are that if you have someone on that network who really wants to uh, listen to your conversations, they'll be able to do that. While this will be very dependent on permissions on the the, the office, or you know what you can, what you will, what what uh, policies are allowed on that on that uh, corporation, um, as in what things can be installed. If it's a bring your own device, or they have no policies, just bring your computer and off you go. Um, they may be able to install things such as such as Wireshark, and Wireshark is an exceptionally useful tool for network diagnostics. Excellent tool. It essentially grabs every single piece of network information that goes in and out of a network interface and lets you do what you want with it. So here's a uh, here's an example of a uh, a, a capture of Wireshark phone call. And from within this, you can actually go to the telephony tab at the top. And there's a thing inside there that says RTP streams and listen to call. So if you were to be on the same network and you heard your manager having some highly confidential uh, conversation and you decided that it was in your best interest to hear it, which it shouldn't be, uh, you could run this, capture that call, listen to it, and then hopefully not get fired. Um, now, things around this as well. There's things you can install on the network, such as secure RTP. I won't go into great detail about this, but what it essentially does is it installs SSL certificates on all end devices and servers. So instead of the RTP being readable, it becomes secure and it, it will stop this kind of thing. It means that instead of it being RTP, it'll be secure RTP. So it's not something that can be decoded in by someone listening in the middle. So, conclusion. Most of the compromised 3CX systems that I've come across is generally due to either default security options being modified. Now they are the modified due to convenience reasons, someone playing with it because people tend to touch things um passwords being shared fall into the wrong hands outdated systems operating systems outdated 36 systems running windows xp which is you know i think version 12 still works on xp you have some really old versions out there and xp can be hacked with about three clicks of a mouse so if you're one of them running windows xp I highly suggest you fix that pretty quick uh, ports and firewalls not being secure, and not just ports and firewalls not being secure, but a combination of things. Uh, ports and firewalls not being secure, poor passwords, and things that will allow hackers in. Using unsupported hardware, IP phones with default passwords and things such as that. Uh, 3CX, well, as a system, if you use the supported hardware, Supported configurations, up-to-date OS, and PBX. Good chances of, the chances of you being compromised are pretty low. I would say it does a really good job of keeping you safe as long as you don't go fiddling with things, uh, changing things you're not supposed to, and use it as it's meant to be used. You have the option of changing things, playing with things, and using it how it's not meant to be used. That's when the bad things start to happen. But if you use it as it's supposed to be used. I would say you are definitely, it's definitely a good system. It's very secure. It offers things like SBCs, 3CX tunnels, um, good anti hacking mechanisms, but just don't use unsupported hardware. Don't change things because you want to play around with it. 
don't just leave, if you leave it as default you're looking pretty good um all right that's it that's me waffling on so um any uh any questions if anyone's still here Hey Adam, just run through some of the questions that are in the chat. Yep. I can do that. Hey everyone. If you're deploying via PBX Express, these rules are already being set. Uh sorry, which um which rules are you re referring to? Because I think PBX Express runs off a um Runs off Linux, pretty sure. So is that relating to the firewall rules? He means the firewall rules, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, they they are. They, uh, yep, yep. So they're deployed on the PBX yep. itself, the not not the router, but the PBX has the firewall rules on there by default. So those ones that I showed with the IP tables list, uh, there, they will be there by default. Yep. Yeah, but that's the firewall rules. The firewall rules are not in place. That's that's also something they have to know. No, they are. The source source IP source IP are not. No, because the, you have to be open. You have to be open. The source IPs are not in in place. But that's right. Yeah, the, on, on the the phone system level, they're not definitely. So the the PBX itself won't have firewall rules with the source IPs, but the router you have to set yourself. So yep, the, the exactly. phone system has to be open, which it is open by default, which is fine. You don't really want to change that. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of trouble registering even local extensions. Yeah, but you but, want to have a router that has those abilities to do that. Yeah, but that's what a lot of people don't do. That's that's why I, I, I said they're not in place, because a lot don't do the, on the PBX Express, they don't shrink down the firewall. Okay. What are the best practice for a remote work scenario? Uh, well, it really depends. Um, it's it depends on what phones they're um, what phones they're using, how many employees they are, how big the company is, where the phone system's installed. You could say best practice in one way would be installing it in the cloud putting the firewall rules on so you only allow SIP for your VoIP provider and having everyone use 3CX soft clients with using 3CX tunnels and or 3CX mobile apps using the 3CX tunnel. That would be fine. But then I don't know if that employee has a boss who decides I want a phone with 20 BLFs or, 10, you know, some people hate soft phones. Some people want a big phone on their desk. And you know, then they can't use a 3CX tunnel unless that person has a, a uh, SBC on site, and the, and then the phone connects through the SBC. But is that person working from home? So does that person then have an SBC for themselves, or do you have 10 people that also want a phone? And then it might be more better practice to install a VPN server and install OpenVPN on that particular handset model. So installing the OpenVPN client on all of these handsets, and the other ones use the VPN on um, use the 3CX VPN. Sorry, 3CX SBC. So that might be an option. Best practice is hard to answer. It depends on your client's recommend that what your client wants and what they have. And then working the practice around what what they have and what you can do with the the equipment they have, and um, you know you might say I can I can get your all this stuff working for for fifty grand, or you can all use a three six phone and it's going to cost you five, and they might then say hey sweet I'll just go with the soft phone. It's it's very hard to if you know if you know what I'm saying. So just quickly, Adam, in regards yep. to the, the SBCs, yep. when should a customer decide to put in an SBC or use either OpenVPN or 3CX Tunnel? So, like, I'm just thinking, like, if a remote site or a customer has remote sites, they have 
five IP phones on a network, should they be using an SBC then, or should they be opening up ports to five of those phones? When do you uh, suggest using an SBC? Uh, five, I'd say f- five's probably a good number, actually, honestly. Um, if the PBX is on site, of course, with the phones, uh, I would use five's a, you know, that's actually five, yeah, I like that number. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, five, yep, let's go with five. Um, the other option is if you have, if you're using VPNs and you can just have VPN keys on the on the phones as well. It depends on what you've got and because um, you might already be using VPNs in your company. So you can just install the VPN keys on your phones and then off you go. But you might not be using VPNs. So then saying let's use open VPNs on my Yaling phones, but you have no VPN server isn't really practical. But I'd say, you know, if you've got a few phones there that your client wants to use, um, but if it's r- remote workers from home with one phone, um, you've got to really weigh up if it's worth them having that phone um, via an SBC or, you know, you say, hey, can you get a public, you know, go to the ISP and say, hey, can you get a static IP address? Get a static IP, open it on the firewall. Um, you know, there's, there's always options, there's always ways around it, but you just got to try and, you know, minimize the, the risk um, right. would be my suggestion. Um, the settings you had in anti-hacking are not defaults. Do you, do you recommend default values? Uh, yes, I recommend default values. They are from my phone system that I'm guessing I've tightened up because of some reasons. Uh, yeah, default value should be fine. I think I changed my ones a bit lower, as in, sorry, is it a bit higher that it blocks it quicker? Um, the default ones should be fine. Is there a way to recover access if the allowed IP address from specific IP addresses is enabled? If for some reason your ISP changes to decide it, even if it's static? Uh, yeah, the, the way would be is, um, it, it depends what you're re- referring to. Uh, you're referring to the web access or what sort of level of access you're talking here? Yeah, I think but, he's talking about web access. So if you lock it down to certain IPs to access the web interface, yep. if the ISP changes, will you get yeah. locked out? Yeah, look, I've, I've locked myself out that way, I won't lie. I'm on, on a dynamic IP and I've put my IP address in there and then it hasn't worked. Uh, what you do is you generally log in locally to the server. So if you log into the server like via Windows RDP or SSH or whatever uh, whatever operating system it's running, it'll be allowed via local host. So then you can log in via that way and then um, just mod- modify it there. So that's one way you can, then you can just go in there and update the IP address or remove it, do what you need to do there. Uh, Sorry, just reading through. Yeah, Mark's right, is um, when you do lock down the ports, don't be concerned when you do a, a scan, when you do a 3CX firewall check, it will fail because it will be not open to 3CX's ports. So because you're only allowing the specific ports you want, it's got the when 3CX try and probe your PBX, it's going to come back as failed, failed, failed because your firewall is blocking it. So you've got two options there is just don't care about it. If you've got no issues, everything's working, don't worry about it. Or you can always allow those IP addresses as well if you want. Um, I don't have them with me, but I've actually never done that. I just, as long as my ISP, not ISP, sorry, my VoIP provider, RTP ports, all that stuff's open, then it's it's fine. If you want the green tick on the dashboard, then just open everything at the beginning after you install 3CX, have that firewall check run, and then afterwards you lock down the ports, and then you get that green tick, everything looks fine, and once you lock down the firewall, everything runs smooth. That's the 
that's the thing what what I usually say in the training. So you can test that firewall checker at the beginning to have that green tick box if you want to have the green tick box, but the green tick box is not really necessary. Important is that the system is safe. Yeah, I mean, green tick box looks nice though. Yeah, it looks um, nice, yes. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, SPC works with dynamic IP. Yeah, pretty sure. Um, as long as your server is a static IP, the connection is the SPC will connect to the server and then it will update the IP. Pretty sure, yeah. That's right, Remo. Uh, um, it works also when you use an enterprise. Uh, enterprise resolves the FQDN so fast and the DNS resolution is so fast that the public change can be brought down to two minutes on on a dynamic IP in front of a 3CX server. Yep. It might not go through every DNS server. So if you have somewhere a DNS server that is updating slow, stuff like that, um, it's, it's not updating that fast, but with an enterprise uh, uh, license, and the correct settings in the stun resolution, so probing the 36 stun server with the correct time, you bring down the change of an IP behind an FQDN to, to two minutes. So from that perspective, yeah, even with, with dynamic IPs in front of the uh, 36 server, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. It just means you don't need to have. I think the question was more relating to yeah, you don't you, need no, a you, on the remote side. On the remote right, side, yeah. where you have the SPC, that's the yeah. idea of having an SPC that you don't need a static IP. Because if you have a static IP, you can lock it down on fifty six. You don't need an SPC. Then hmm. that's the that's the thing, you know. And I would I would say it is a, a prash, prashanta. It is. Uh, Prashant, it is a concern in regards of that you should lock down that firewall in front of you, if possible, to only allow the IPs. Yeah, so there's always a, an, a firewall in front of the 36, even if it's in Asia, and this one you have to lock down. There's, yeah. In every cloud server is a, a firewall in front, and that firewall is not touched by 36, as I said before to Ash, because they don't know the source IPs you are having. Yeah, the example I had was actually from that uh, same hosted platform. So I um the screenshot I had was from Asia hosted. So there is a firewall section in there where you can add source IPs to stop that. Um, look, it's a I wouldn't say it's a massive concern. I mean, look, anyone trying to hack your system is always a concern. No one likes it. Uh, it's best to minimise the amount of time someone can try and get in. The, as 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 long as you set up, as Adam said before, like you keep the original, um, like extension, auth ID, password, and the um, the web password of the phones and the security settings in the anti-hacking section on the, on the system and also combine that with an extreme restriction on the outbound rules so that you do, do extension-based rules, uh, group-based rules and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, it's just I would say in that regard, it's just annoying that then literally the three CX will have to pay firewall, and 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 is not doing mainly then the job it is meant to do, like uh, uh, handling phone calls. Yeah, it um, uses a bit more resources having to deal with rubbish uh, requ requests being thrown at it. Yeah, we had customers, but not with 3.6, but we had them with other phone systems where the, fo the, the customer has not been able anymore to receive and make phone calls because he has been under such a pressure with uh, being severely hacked. It was really like go undergoing a distributed denial of service attack um, from the, the flow of um of data that came to the system so that the, the system and the internet traffic of the customer uh, couldn't 
cope anymore with 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 anything else so they were not able to establish or receive phone calls anymore because the system was so hammered yeah so that's the thing then that might result um once they figure out that there is an open pbx any other any other questions guys that i can attempt to answer if not you're welcome to send me a follow-up email i'll see what i can do All right, well, uh, thanks very much for listening to me attempt to uh, tell you how to secure your PBX. Um, again, any, any questions, just let me know and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.